what happened back then in ancient Egypt, who built the pyramids, how they built the pyramids, why they built the pyramids. The pharaohs at the time, they were known as the sons of God. The nickname at the time was Fetisol, and they came here from different planets during a different era. The Fetisol were able to get to the eighth dimension, the ninth dimension. For them, it was part of their life. There are a lot of claims in the document about crazy things that the pyramids can do. Forget about just the lasers coming out of the apex, communicating with other planets and staying in constant communication, but actual flight. How is it that stone can suddenly fly? Every pyramid could levitate and fly and move between planets. Even with the shape that the pyramids are in right now, is it possible to activate them in the same way right now? Yes. They don't want you to know about spaceships. They don't want you to know about levitation and ask yourself why. Because where is the energy coming from? They know how to harness the energy and make a pyramid fly. Now imagine you have this technology today. Your house, your car, your factories, free energy, no electricity. They don't want to give you free energy because again, free energy translates to money. Money translates to power. They need to control you. What if I told you that the mysteries of ancient Egypt no longer needed to be mysteries? What if there was a way to actually know what happened a few thousand years ago? And what if that knowingness and awareness could bring us to an incredible place today by understanding the power that we had back then and how to tap back into that power today? The day today is June 20th of 2023. And I'm sitting here with Ray in an undisclosed location in New York to speak about the Pyramid Code document, the document that he wrote that he gave me in 2020 that basically started my public journey that brought a lot of attention to the TLS organization, to everything that they're doing with their choice, really, because that's when they decided to come out to the public and say, here we are, here's what we do, who we are, and why we're doing it. They've been doing incredible work for a very, very long time, but my job with them started in 2020, specifically, publicly speaking. And today we're gonna to be speaking about that work specifically from Ray's perspective, all about the Pyramid Code document. The Pyramid Code is a very, very powerful document that speaks about the truths of ancient Egypt. What happened back then? Who built the pyramids? Why were they built? What were the uses of those things? Were they really just tombs? And if not, how could their technology back then apply to our technology today? How can we tap back into that technology once again and access it for all? Because free energy technology is very much a part of what we're going to be speaking about today. So before we dive into this topic, for those who haven't seen the Disclosure series yet, I do want to set a foundation so people can understand who you are. And I want to start with a very simple question. Over the past few interviews that we've done together, every interview that we've done together, you felt the need to hide your identity. You're still choosing to do that now, obviously. Why are you choosing to continue to hide your identity after you're really seeing that people are receiving this information with open arms? Well, the people that are receiving this information are more or less your viewers or your type of community. There's 8 billion people in this world. I promise you that 99% of them will not accept this information. They'll think it's a bunch of bullshit. You know, before, they said that you might be interviewing yourself, and we've discussed this in the past. So I don't exactly agree with you on that, but I'm a private man. My mission, my work, is very secretive. So I'd like to keep it like that. I don't want to be known. I don't want to be walking in the street and be known like you are, you know? You walk on the street and people approach you, they hug you, they kiss you, 
They take a selfie with you. I'm not about that. I don't want to do that because, again, I have to protect myself, my family, my friends, even the organization in a way, and also yourself. But you don't agree with me, and that's your decision. I know you do a lot of good, and I admire you, and I commend you for this. This is really great work, but people like you are usually going to pay a price, and if you are prepared to pay a price, it's your decision. I just have to tell you as a friend, as a close friend, you might want to rethink what you're doing, but you choose your path in life. I'm not going to stand in your way. I will help you if and when I can. Not always I'll be able to help you. That's part of it. Again, you insisted on creating a new series, and you're calling it The Pyramid Code. You want to discuss the document, I'm sure. I don't know where this interview is going to go, but I'm sure it's going to spill into different areas different subjects and issues, current affairs maybe. As you said, you want transparency. I'll do my best to give you full transparency, but you and your viewers might not like what I'm going to have to say, so the choice is yours. There's one thing that I want to correct you on. It wasn't just my idea to bring the Pyramid Code as a series of interviews with you, however that extends. It was your boss or your superior, whatever you want to call her, that actually asked me to do that in December of 2022. And she was the one that guided me. Yes, I had the idea, but she was the one that said, continue your interviews moving forward. And from there, make sure to focus on the pyramid code specifically. Do you have any idea why she interfered? Because usually she doesn't. Why she interfered and said, go and do that directly. Well, she more than just interfered. She even forced my hand, so-called, to make this interview happen. I'm not for these interviews. I'm not. I'm against it in general. I wrote this document because it was an order. So I did it as an order, not because I wanted to. So I'm here to relay certain information. You have questions, obviously. And you told me that a lot of your followers, viewers, have a lot of questions. Again, I'll do my best to answer them. As truthfully and transparent as possible. But again, keep in mind, I can't always tell you everything. I want to, you know, dive into this document. But before I do, I have a few more questions. You're saying you're not for it. You want to stay private. You don't want to do it. Why would you agree to this interview then? You didn't have to. Not exactly. I didn't have to when it comes to you. But when my boss got involved, it's different. So it's not exactly that I didn't have to. And she asked you specifically to do this. It was more of a command. It wasn't a request. It's the same. If you allow me to compare when you started a year ago, a little bit more, when you started your relationship with Dr. Sandra Rose Michael, it wasn't exactly something you were thrilled about. You were hesitant. You were not sure. You weren't sure what the purpose was. You were not sure about the mission. You were not sure why they wanted to do this. And if you remember, you even came to me and asked me, what's my opinion? And I told you. My advice was to go and do the interview. It will, it will be big. If they tell you it's going to be big, it's going to be big. You can count on what they say. Just follow the orders. So you were not thrilled to go. You got excited after the first interview, but before the first interview, you weren't that excited. And then when you found a new world, and you look where you are a year later, 300 centers all over the world. Again, I'm very proud of you. I think you're doing great work. They chose you for a reason. They knew why they were choosing you. And not. I could not have done what you have done. I cannot speak like you. I cannot charm the audience the way you do. You have something about you that I don't have, and that's why you have the job you have, and I have the job I have. So I'm doing things more behind closed doors. You do things more in the open. Everybody does their own thing. I just want you to be careful when it comes to your private life. You are too much in the open. You are too much in the public eye. And there are certain people out there. They're not going to like what you do. It's a part of the job. Yes, but it's something you have to calculate into your formula. Do you have any other way of doing it? I'm not sure. I don't know. Again, I admire people like you. You have the balls to do it, what you're doing. I think you have a lot of balls to do it. You have a lot of friends in the industry, in the business to do it. Again, it takes guts. You know, a lot of people in your field were poisoned. 
killed, murdered. That happens all the time. So just be careful. Before we continue into this document, I want to just give the, the viewers and the audience a little backstory about what the Pyramid Code really is. So it was in 2020, and we'll speak about this in the interview today, but it was in 2020 when I was invited to a meeting in February of 2020. And throughout this meeting with TLS, the Light System Organization, basically Ray was ordered, and if you want to speak about this, that would be great for you to give your backstory as well, but Ray was ordered to write this document known as the Pyramid Code. And Basically, I was given it a few months later, and on September 9th of 2020, I was asked to publish it to the world. I didn't have a public platform at that time. I didn't have a big presence on social media, really anywhere. I was just, you know, a normal guy doing what I was doing and working in my family's business. I published this thing. It reached millions of people all around the world very, very quickly. And that started this whole process that, you know, this path that I'm on today and I'm on with you today in the organization as a whole. Now, this document speaks about who built the pyramids, how they built the pyramids, the technology behind it, the entities, the beings, the nations back then, how the world looked back then. It's a very spiritually oriented doc document with a lot of physical and tangible things that happened back then with actual details from Ray's memory. And now we're moving into the realm of reincarnation memories and all that, which I want to ask you about as well today in terms of you know, how that even happens and how you know that it's real over hallucination. But before we get to that point, you're a businessman. You have nothing to do with this world. You're, you're, you're wealthy, you're big in what you do, you're great with what you do. How do the two worlds connect? How did you go from being this businessman, having nothing to do with the spiritual world to this whole new world that you've brought me into knowing nothing about it, you know, 14, 15 years ago? So the same way I approached you a few years ago, I didn't tell you about TLS. I didn't tell you about a secret organization. I just befriended you and we became friends. And through this relationship, slowly, slowly, I showed you and taught you, showed you a different lifestyle. I brought you more towards the reality of the spiritual world that you were into before you met me. But you, you had no clue basically, you had no clue. So I was there more to guide you and to bring you on. Same thing happened to me. Someone approached me in different ways. Okay, let's put it this way. My adventure started in January 29th, 2010. Before that, I was a very, very normal human being. The first time I heard the term, the word TLS, was the end of 2010. And then I was introduced to the organization. And then I was introduced to my boss. She's my boss till today. And then I was taught bigger things and bigger missions and more interesting missions, and all kinds of crazy stuff. But it was slowly. It was done very slowly. In the spiritual world, we're in 2023 right now. What I have done is at the speed of light. It's very fast. I was lucky enough to get it faster with others in the organization. Why? I don't know. But things just happened. So the same way they brought you on, they brought me on. And I got, and it got crazier by the day. And as you know by now, you know a lot of things now that you didn't know, or two years ago. And you find these new things every day. Incredible, I'm sure, for you. And it's fascinating. And it's totally out of this world. But I think you're slowly learning that this is the real reality. Not the fake reality that many people live on a daily basis. This is all fake. The media is all fake. Politics is all fake. This is a brainwashing system that's been done for many, 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 many years. It didn't start today. It didn't start in the last 10 years. So you are in a position today where I started in 2010, where you're seeing the world in a different light from a different perspective. Think about it. You are 25 years old. You're going to be 26 soon. You started this when you were 24. You really started when you were 22, if you think about it, even before that. But if you take the E-system, you really started this a year ago. You started, you're talking 300 locations in about a year. Starbucks doesn't open 300 locations in one year, okay? So it didn't come from nowhere. When they told you, and do what you're told, don't worry, it will be a big success. They don't make such promises unless they can back it up. 
and they backed it up. Yeah, you're the spokesperson. You get all the credit together with Dr. Sandra. I'm not saying no, but if you think about it, the real credit goes to TLS, and if it wasn't TLS, you would not open 300 centers. So they took you, they gave you a mission, they backed you up in the back end, they try not to interfere too much, but believe me, without the interference, you would not have 300 locations. There are some people that I'm sure are probably seeing this for the first time. Maybe they watched Disclosure, maybe they haven't. Maybe they read the Pyramid Code, maybe they haven't, whatever it may be. I wanna make sure that we're setting a foundation to preface for those people so everybody knows what we're talking about. So when you say they, you're referring to the TLS organization, otherwise known as the Light System Organization. Can you give a bigger picture into you know, what this organization is in just a few sentences, if you had to summarize who they are, the work that they do and why they do it, how could you do that? First of all, my advice to any of your viewers who have never watched the Disclosure series, I think it would be very smart if they go and watch the Disclosure series. It will give them a different outlook on life and maybe a little bit of awareness of what the hell is going on. Basically, to summarize TLS, I would describe it as a spiritual organization. Think about it as a spiritual CIA. Nothing to do with the CIA, of course. The CIA is a corrupt, evil organization. But it's a secretive organization that does work all over the world and outside of this world, outside of this planet. Today, they have about 8,500 members worldwide. They have a chapter in every major city in the world, in almost every country in the world. Its purpose is to improve humanity as a whole, in general, so they could be in any field with any subject. But everything is done in order to change things for the better. For humanity, that's basically what they do. And when you say change, can you give examples of things that they would do that would interfere, but not in a negative way with human? They would use a guy like you to bring awareness into the world. And that's exactly what you've been doing. So awareness is like the main subject, I would say. At the same time, if they know there is a fake natural disaster, they will try to stop it. And they did. They will stop it or try to stop it. Usually they succeed, not always. If there are crimes committed, for example, the children, the underground tunnels that we spoke about many times before, they are very much involved with that. And they will stop it. They will release the kids. They will help the kids. Again, I work with them and I respect their work. But I don't think they do enough. I have a different style of doing things. They're more of the, they're more like you. Meaning you, you like to do, you like to do light, peace, and love. This is your motto. Fine. I'm all for it. I'm not a violent individual. But when you're dealing with psychopaths who are running this world, for example, Klaus Schwab, which he is your real president. People like him should be taken out. You cannot do it with light, peace, and love. You gotta use violence sometimes. And I'm more leaning in that direction, but TLS is against it. They, ha they have their ways of doing things. The skeptics would say such a powerful undercover organization, how do you know they're not deceiving you? How do you know that they're not using you to do something negative and you think that they're doing something for a positive purpose, but they're not? Because I've seen what they're doing. I've been involved. I saw it with my own eyes. So I know it's not negative. I know it's positive. I don't think they're doing enough, though. They just want to do it very under the radar. Quiet. No casualties. They'll do whatever they can to stop any bloodshed. But when you have a war, and we are at war, I don't know if people understand. World War III is here. The Third World War is here already. It started. When you have a war, you have to go and fight it. You can't fight it with flowers, but that's my opinion. And the rest is up to TLS. I have what to say about that, but we're not gonna have that conversation now. I wanna dive deeper into this document because the purpose of this interview is really the pyramid code, to speak about this whole document from all perspectives, specifically from your perspective, because you're the one who wrote it, you gave it to me, and you know the rest is history. So let's go to February 6th. February 6th of 2020, about two weeks before then you called me. I even remember where I was sitting. It was a very exciting phone call that I got. And you said, clear your schedule on this day, meet me here 
and don't ask questions. And I already understood, you know, what that meant and where we were going and whatnot in terms of a meeting with the organization, with TLS and so on and so forth. So we meet on February 6th and I want you to share whatever you're comfortable sharing from your perspective. But just to give everybody a backstory of February 6th specifically, basically on that day was the day that everything really started for me because it was like, an initiation without it being an initiation. I don't really know how to explain it. Maybe you can explain it better, but it was what started a more official part of my journey with the organization. And that's also the day that you were asked to write the pyramid code and share it with everybody in that meeting. So can you just share whatever you're comfortable with regarding that meeting on February 6th and we'll just take it from there? I don't want to give too many details, but the focus of this meeting was to introduce you to the group and to try to recruit you as a spokesperson for the organization, which you accepted, which was against my advice, but you accepted it. And the second one was more of a surprise for me that I was requested to write the pyramid code. And the reason that it surprised me is because it is because it's really the Pyramid Code is taking place in the year 2448, according to the Hebrew calendar, which I think is the year 1300 BC or something like that. I don't know the exact dates, and it was really describing my life experience, which was my first reincarnation to this world. And so I gave a lot of private information on myself at that time, from what I remember, which was a surprise to me. I always wanted to write it down, but I never got permission to do it. Suddenly, they gave me permission, not only to write it, but to publish it and give it to the public. When you say you weren't given permission, what, what do you mean by that? Who's stopping you from writing a memory that's your own? TLS. Why would they stop you from writing something? Oh, they stopped me from writing a lot of things, especially in the beginning. I couldn't, I couldn't take down notes or anything like that. Because I knew and I was afraid I'm going to forget things. So I wanted to write them down and know I was not given permission. And slowly, slowly, I got permission to write other reincarnations, which I did. And I kept it for myself, never in the public. And suddenly they're saying, okay, in I always wanted to write the 2448 reincarnation, give it to my close friends who are a part of TLS, who, even my wife, who knew what was going on. So I wanted to share this with her. I was not allowed. Forget share it. I couldn't even speak about it. Suddenly I was given permission to do it in writing and in public, which really didn't make sense to me. It still doesn't make sense to me, but it was ordered. I did it. And you have the document. In the document itself, I remember you wrote, I now understand why I wasn't allowed to write it for so many years. I can't speak about that. Why not? I can't speak about it. I know what you're looking for. I can't speak about it. I can't tell you. But I understand better today why the timing and why. I understand why specifically on this date. I understand why they're trying to go public and they decided for the first time really to go public. Never ever anybody, nobody, and you can check whatever you want. Nobody ever heard about TLS. Nobody knew anything about this organization or its name until you showed up on the scene. You were the first one who said the word TLS. Nobody ever spoke about it. Nobody. Publicly. Publicly. How do you explain that an organization that's been around for thousands of years, nobody spoke about it. It's not anywhere. Nobody slipped up. Nobody went against them. Nobody was corrupt from within it. How do you explain that? First of all, they chose not to go public. And if you on the inside, and it's happened, very rarely, but it's happened. Certain individuals betray. You're going to be dealt with. What do you mean by dealt with? Figure it out for yourself. Okay, let's go with that for a second. You're dealt with, but you still said something publicly. So you're telling me that in the history of this organization, nobody's gone out and did something that was irreversible? He was dealt with before he opened his mouth. They know that? They know a lot of things before you even know about it yourself. Yes. Let's go into, let's go into the, 
the you know controversial topics of reincarnation for a second. I know that the first part of this document is really focused on your memory. You know, your memory of your life in the year 2448, according to the Hebrew calendar, which is, like you said, it's about 1300 before Christ, something around that time. Before we even speak about your memories, I want to acknowledge the elephant in the room for the majority of the world that doesn't believe in reincarnation. Maybe a lot of my viewers do, but we want to reach the masses. You want to reach billions of people. Like you said, there are 8 billion people on this planet. And we need to reach those people. So let's acknowledge that for a second. With reincarnation, science tells us, at least modern day scientists will tell us it's a bunch of nonsense. How are you so sure that reincarnation is real? I have a vivid memory of certain things. For example, the 2448 reincarnation, as I call it. This was my first reincarnation. I was born in the year 1360 BC. I know the exact date I was born. I remember it. And I remember, and by the way, it was my longest reincarnation on earth, and I remember a lot of things, but you can't verify it because it happened so long ago. But I'll give you a different reincarnation that happened in the last 80 years. I remember it exactly. I remember certain people who have a memory as well. I met those people, and we spoke about the experience, and we both have the same memory. Not only that, I went, I traveled to a certain country in Europe, to the place I was born and living, where everything happened. And I found the house, and I found certain buildings, places of prayers that we had, and everything I remembered was there. This is something I did with my wife, for example. I was allowed to travel with her, and just for me to find out. I can't go back to the year 1360 BC and find the building, but I can do it if it happened 80 years ago. I found the community, I found the city, the neighborhood, the building, the house, the apartment, the place of worship, and all that. It's very real. I spoke about it before, and therefore I know again, in the beginning, I thought I'm going to go crazy, okay? Because suddenly my memory came back to me in the year 2011. Up to that time, I had no clue. Something happened in one of the missions I went on. Something happened. And from that moment, I started seeing things and remembering things that in the beginning, I was sure I'm going crazy. I was sure that I have some mental damage from that experience on that mission, and it took people from TLS to teach me and show me that it's real. And they put me through the system and showed me that I'm not crazy. In the beginning, you think you're crazy. The stress was enormous. It was hard for me to function. You have to learn how to function in your real life. Today, in the year 2023, you have to be able to live your experience from the year 1360 BC, or the year whatever. You know what I'm saying? It's not easy. But I went through training, and they showed me. They taught me. And today I'm sure it's not. It's not just a dream. I know because I know the people who can remember as well. By the way, for example, your best friend today, Dr. Sandra Michael, speak to her. She remembers every reincarnation that she was there. And she remembers a lot of details. And believe me, this woman, she's not crazy. She has a very high IQ, very intelligent person. She thinks differently. She sees everything differently from us. And she remembers. She remembers. And she's going way back. Talk to her. She'll tell you. I'm sure you did. But why don't you put her on interviews? She'd be more willing. She doesn't care. She's willing to say whatever you want. She's not hiding anything. I'm different. I have a wall in front of me, and I like to protect myself. She doesn't. She will talk to you about anything. I have had conversations with her about those things, and she always speaks to me about Atlantis. And she also speaks to me about uh, her being in ancient Egypt. Do you have any memory of her there? I'm not going to talk about her and me. I'm not going to do this. But I suggest if you want to find somebody else better than me, because I'm hiding a lot of things, she's very open. You want transparency? She's very transparent. She's going to sound crazy to you, but maybe not to you. You're on a different level today. She's going to sound crazy to your viewers, but she knows what she's talking about. She was here. Every reincarnation that she has come into this world was for one purpose only, healing the planet. And look what she's doing today. Same thing. 
She had an experience in 2010 or 2011, I don't remember, and she spoke about it publicly. The TLS approached her specifically for this machine called the Energy Enhancement System. I wasn't at this meeting, of course, but I know she had a meeting. She told us that she was in a meeting, and certain requests and demands were made upon her, and she agreed to go with it. And ten years later, you showed up on the scene, also being sent by TLS. You were in shock when she told you. Oh, of course, I know TLS. You were like, wow, I finally found somebody other than Ray that is willing to talk about TLS. So, she did what she did. I think the technology is great. The technology speaks for itself. You see the miracles that are happening. Nobody can explain it. Okay? It's working. So maybe, maybe you should interview her about stuff like that. I think that's a good idea. How do you go about remembering these things? I know you said something happened in 2011. I think you actually spoke about it in one of our past interviews in the Disclosure series. Can you maybe touch up a little on that and explain to us if there are any methods or techniques that you can share with the viewers of how to go about remembering something like that? If you ask me to remember now a certain reincarnation, first of all, I have to concentrate really deep. It's almost like meditating, but it's not. I would call it concentrating. I have to shift to a different frequency, but mostly to a different dimension. And we are, most humans on this planet today, are between the first and second dimension. Some people like you, starting to be more aware. Very few in this first, very small part of the population can be in the third dimension. But for me to come and give you my memories, I need to shift to the fifth dimension. If you're going to ask me to do it now, I can't because you're in the room with me, with those cameras. I gotta do it on my own. I'm not that good. There are people who can shift like that with no problem. I cannot do it like that. I got to, I got to concentrate on something. I got to do my meditation, if you want to call it that. And within a very short period of time, I can reach the fifth dimension. It needs to be the fifth in the tenth level. Gamma 10. Gamma 10. It's the fifth dimension. But within the dimension, you have levels. Gamma is starting with the fifth dimension. That's what I have to do. Obviously, one day, all of us will reach not only the fifth, I think we can, in a short time. I believe the world is going to this direction right now. And don't be surprised if a lot of people, not only you, but a lot of people will be able to reach the ninth dimension. Ninth dimension. That means, I'll just give you a small example. You can speak to spirits, meaning dead people. Souls from the past. You'll be able to talk to them. So if you want to speak to your grandmother or whoever, somebody, your cousin, somebody close to you who passed away would be able to, would be able to do that. And I'm not talking to you a hundred years from now. I'm talking in a relative short time. I think it will happen. We're going there. Something has to shift in this world for this to happen. But that's how we get there. So back to me. I need to shift myself. Once I shift my brain frequency into the fifth dimension, I'm able to remember, but I can concentrate only on one reincarnation at a time. Again, because I'm considered to be a rookie. People on a high level who can do much better than the fifth dimension, for example, Rabbi AA, who you speak about all the time, he can do it. He's on a totally different level. Totally different level. And for, you know, most people around the world that are interested in these topics that are going down that rabbit hole of, you know, past life regressions and things like that. How would we know what is an imagination versus what is real? Do you have any pointers on that? What's the name of the doctor from Florida that does hypnosis? You remember his name? I don't remember his name right now. Dr. Brian Weiss. Okay, if you take Dr. Brian Weiss and you study his books... He has a lot of proof, and he documented a lot of it. He's basically taking a person who has a physical ailment, and through his past life regression, and being able to remember certain things and understanding what happened in past lives, suddenly he's healing his physical ailment today. For me, that's proof. Another thing of proof of reincarnation, by the way, I think every religion believes in reincarnation. So I don't think you have to convince most people about the fact that reincarnation exists. I believe today, most people on the planet believe reincarnation is a real thing. So that's an easy sell. 
the memory part of it, that's an issue. But again, if you want to prove reincarnation to somebody, you take the subject. For example, let's take your sister, okay? She's a normal human being. She lives here in the United States. You put her under hypnosis. You know the only language she can speak is English. She knows some Hebrew because of your parents. So she has two languages. You gave this example already in a past interview of her being able to speak Chinese under regression, let's say. Correct. So that's a good example. So if you take, you take a subject like that, you know exactly what she can do or not do because it's somebody you know very well. And suddenly she's speaking ancient Chinese where have to bring a translator to translate what the hell she's talking about. That's a proof of reincarnation. And she's describing a past life a thousand years ago in China, whatever, you know. That's a proof of reincarnation. And there's a lot of documented cases like this. It's not a make-believe case I'm giving you. There's a lot of documented cases where especially children, I'm talking about young children, three years old, four years old, five years old, when they can barely talk, and they're sharing stories about reincarnation. When you go check the information, you find it's real. They give you names, dates, addresses. And when you go back to, there was a very famous story about a boy here in the United States that said he was a pilot in World War II. And he was Irish, I believe. And they went back. They found his family. They found his home. They found the address. He described how he died. He described the whole new thing. Now, you cannot say a four-year-old is lying. You can't make this up, you know? If it's an adult, you could always say something is lying. But when an adult is speaking a language that you know they cannot speak, you know that's you know that it's a real thing. For, for the record, I agree with you. I, I have to ask these questions because we also want to reach the people that don't understand this. And that's why I wanted to set the foundation with reincarnation specifically because a big part of this document has to do with reincarnation, your memories. To make your life easier, a person who is not an atheist definitely agrees with you on these subjects. So that's something you're going to have a hard time with with my opinion. An atheist, which I think it's a joke. Even the term atheist is a joke, but there are people who claim they're atheist. These are the only people who are going to tell you that you're full of shit, but you're not going to talk about them now. They're really lost souls in my book, so I'm not going to waste my energy on them. So why don't we move on, you know, officially into this document? We, <laughs> we had a long conversation leading up to it, but let's Let's dive into this document a little bit more, the Pyramid Code itself. We could start really wherever you want. Maybe we could start with a zoomed out picture. I can ask you a base question of what happened back then? From your memory, you claim you were there, you have those memories. There's a lot of different theories right now, all the way from extraterrestrial life to is just human beings that moved stone with like water or something like that. Everybody has a different theory. What is your memory that you remember with in-depth detail? If you had to paint a big, clear picture of what happened back then in ancient Egypt, who built the pyramids, how they built the pyramids, why they built the pyramids. I know that's a lot of questions in one, but let's just start and go for it. Let me summarize for you as best that I can do. I'll start with the fact that I was born in the year 1360 BC, which is really, according to the Hebrew calendar, which is what I usually go by, which is the year 2400. I was born on the first Hebrew month, on the first day of the Hebrew month. At a certain point, at the age of about seven or eight, I was taken to, let's call it to, let's call it the palace where the Pharaoh was, but not into the palace. Every palace had a shrine that had the high priest. I was born into a Hebrew family which, as you call it, were the slaves at that time. Which I don't know if you want to call them slaves. But let's call them slaves for the sake of this conversation. So I was born into the family of Hebrews. There were no Jews at that time. I was taken to the palace. To the shrine, where the high priest was. And eventually I was taught to become part of the shrine, part of this. Being a high priest which later in my life, I became a high priest. 
not in the time of the pharaohs. It was when the Hebrews arrived to Israel, as we know today, and from Hebrews they became Jews. As part of the Jewish nation at the time, I was, I moved with them from Egypt into Israel. I eventually became the high priest, which I served until the end of my life. I lived over 900 years in this reincarnation, which, by the way, was my longest reincarnation. So far, I have 69 reincarnations, but I can only remember for some reason only 23. I was trained by the high priest. I was exposed into the life of the shrine and the life of the palace. By the way, the high priest at that time was you. You were the high priest at the time, and I was under your wing, and you were training me, and through you, I got to very high places within the shrine. Over there, they teach you about everything you can possibly think of. This life, past lives, meditation. The high priest was highly, highly spiritually motivated. The pharaohs at the time, which were known to the common man during that era, they were known as the sons of God. That's the way they called them. The nickname at the time was Fetisol. That's the name they use, Fetisol the sons of God, and for the common man during that era, Egyptians or Hebrews, doesn't make a difference. They were God for them. They perceived them as gods. And they came here from different planets during a different era, which I'm not going to get into right now. It's not important. But the pharaohs were running the whole world. They were highly evolved entities as well that later contaminated themselves by mating with the common woman or the common man on the other part. And as I said, eventually when the Hebrews left Egypt, the famous story about Exodus, I became at a certain point, many years after that, the high priest with my wife at the time. My name was Mono. Her name was Gamma. She was part of the Fatisol, the pharaohs. We fell in love. But when the Hebrew left to Israel, we left together and we actually got married in the desert. And we lived together until the destruction of the temple, the Jewish temple. She served with me as a high priest as well. She had a different title, not a high priest, which was very uncommon because she was a woman and she was not a Hebrew. She was part of the Fatisol. She was not one of the Jewish nation, but she was highly respected. Can I interject? I, I, I don't want to you know, interrupt you while you're going, but I have a lot of questions along the way. Let's start with, you know, one of the first ones. Number one, you mentioned that I'm the high, I was the high priest back then. How, how do you, why don't I remember? Most people don't remember, but most people were here before. Very few people are new souls. You were here many times before. Part of the process in the shrine in Egypt was to teach you how to remember, how to connect to the divine, how to move dimensions. You were my teacher at that time. I am a type of guide right now for you, but I'm not your teacher. But if you would be able to go through this process, you might be able to remember. Everybody has the capacity to remember. It all depends on what you're going through and who is there to show you the light. I was one of the lucky guys. In 2010, I was a very normal guy, you know, a family man, businessman. I had nothing to do with the spirit world, absolutely nothing. And suddenly, somebody shows up on the scene and takes me through this process. And by the way, if you speak to my mentor, who happens to be over 400 years old, when he was 50 years old, somebody approached him. So it's always somebody approaching you and recruiting you into the organization. And at the same time, they put you through a process that gives you those abilities. And those abilities, if you can reach the right dimensions, you can meditate and touch the light. I know it's hard to understand. You can meditate and see the spirit world. You're not allowed to talk to them unless they talk to you. I would never talk to a dead person, but I've been approached by dead people. Again, crazy thing. Scary thing. You doubt yourself all the time. Maybe you're going crazy and you're making stuff up. So it's a process. Those days, we were able, the Fatisol were able to get to the eighth dimension, the ninth dimension. For them, it was part of their life and the teaching. Every son or daughter of the Pharaoh at the time 
went through this process as a child. And then they go back to the palace. Then people like me, who were Hebrews, some of them were doing the same process, but never to the level of the pharaohs, of the Fatisol. They were a different level, a different breed, different blood. For example, Gamma was my wife at the time. We didn't leave Egypt. This would never happen. There was no way that a Hebrew would marry the daughter of a pharaoh. I have to stop you for a second because something that you're saying doesn't make sense to me on a personal level. On one hand, you're saying that this this race of pharaohs that came from somewhere else are, you know, highly spiritually evolved and basically see all as one. Why would they have a problem if you marry life that's also part of their oneness that isn't a part of their race? It, it sounds racist. How does a spiritually advanced being come in and say, no, you can't marry that Hebrew, let's say. Who told you that they saw us as one? In the document, it says that their awareness, that their consciousness was basically liberated, spiritually speaking. They weren't, you know, limited to the limitations of time and space because they saw everything as one, because they were in universal awareness, because they were one with all. It specifically says there was no us and them or here and there in their awareness and their consciousness. But at the same time, you're saying that, you know, a Pharaoh wouldn't be able to marry a Hebrew. The two don't go together. First of all, let's go back to the beginning. Where did the Phanisol come from? They came from four different planets. Planets that were destroyed. Why? I don't know. But I know they came from four different planets to four different corners of this world. One of the reasons they came, I think because they lost their planet, or something happened there. Number two, the purpose was to come, again, for the betterment of humankind. Because humankind, at that time, was not as highly evolved as the beginning of time. If you want to talk about the very first man, I don't think there is such a thing as very first man. So the very first community, let's say, were highly evolved people. They lived long lives. All of them were vegans. They didn't eat animals. They didn't use animals to enslave them, you understand. And eventually, those people who were highly evolved creatures, human beings in your book, became corrupt to a certain level. That means their spiritual identity, their spiritual level went down. Not to zero, but went down. That's all came in. Highly evolved individuals, entities, in order to to upgrade them. What happened within time? Not only they didn't upgrade them to the right level, they started to mate with them. And when you mate with them, you start corrupting the DNA of the entity. And then, that's what, by the way, brought the destruction and elimination of Fatisol. Do you understand? A very short time after the Hebrews went to Israel, the pharaohs were done. They were finished. Okay. The pharaoh that I knew was the very last pharaoh in existence. There was no pharaoh after him. They were destroyed. And again, why did they get destroyed? Because they came here to do a job. And they didn't do it the right way. They started to mate. And the desire of these entities to do certain things that it's not supposed to do destroyed them. It happens today also if you think about it. Instead of elevating, our society is at a level zero almost, especially today. Look at the young people. Look at the youth today. What do they have? TikTok and Instagram? I don't know what garbage they're using. Facebook? They're brain dead. Take the average teenager in the United States and ask them who is the president or the vice president. Most of them will not know the answer. They will not know the answer. It's sad. A lot of them don't know how to read or write, and they are being accepted to college. That's very sad. So they took the level down, you understand? So instead of trying to elevate, they see that it's so bad that they're making new requirements. Instead of elevating the requirements, they're decreasing them. So you're basically saying that back to the pyramid code and what happened back then, they were highly spiritually evolved. And at the point where with your experience, like you said, you and Gamma at the time would have never been able to get married at that point and be together because you were a Hebrew and she was, I guess, the daughter of a pharaoh, correct? Yes, and I was considered to be a third-class citizen. 
I know the scriptures use the word slaves, and they describe a lot of torture and beatings. That's not true. They were doing the work, but they were getting fed. They were getting clothed. There was no salary. Their salary was the food, basically. Their shelter was their salary. So they were living an okay life, but without any, any assets, any money. That's what, by the way, Klaus Schwab wants to do today. You're not going to own anything, and you'll be very happy. They've been brainwashing society already to do that. The pharaohs, the Fatisols of that time, were the controllers. They were the leaders in running the show. They were perceived by the common man as God. This was God for them. They didn't see God in any other way. So it's very important that you understand the psyche at the time. So you're talking about people who were highly evolved spiritually, who are mating with the exact opposite. I think it was in the last portion of Disclosure, that interview that we did together, you mentioned how, and by the way, your boss mentioned this to me as well, how there was something with the sons of God and manipulation on the level of DNA with the female essence on earth and this whole story that basically created religion as it is and messed up you know, energy, spiritually speaking, that we now have to get to a point where we can reunite and eradicate that division. Does this have to do with that? Yes. So this, this genetic manipulation was done through mating or through like a laboratory? No, it was done through mating at that time. And if you pay attention, the very first time monotheism came into play is when Abraham showed up on the scene many years before that. But he wasn't a Jew. He was a Hebrew. When the Jews so-called received the Bible from God, as the scriptures are saying, it was the first time that somebody put laws against incest. Against certain foods you're supposed to eat or not eat. There were no laws before. Everyone did what the hell they wanted to do. The job of the Fatisol was to create those laws and bring society to a common level and become one. But they never succeeded. So at a certain point, the Hebrews came in with the Bible, and in there we have laws. For example, when a father had intercourse with his daughter, before that time it was okay. Brother and sister was okay. This was all okay. The Bible was the first time that something came in and said, no, stop. There are rules and regulations. You cannot have intercourse with your daughter. You could not have intercourse with your brother. So suddenly they came in. The rules and regulations were supposed to be set in place by the Fatisol through spirituality, not through putting the law of the land and force people to do things. Not only did they fail, they started to contaminate themselves. And mating is part of the problem. Yes, mating is part of it. Not the only problem, but it's part of it. Food is another thing. If you go back to the scriptures, everybody in the beginning of time was a vegan, and it says specifically in the Bible, once you reach the days of Noah, after the big flood, suddenly God comes in and gives you the new rules and explains that he's not giving you a present. It's more of, it's more of a punishment because it was a very corrupt society. And this is the first time he is bringing the laws of what we call kosher. It's all a bunch of bullshit. It's another con job to make money and to control the people and to control the masses and to buy the people. So suddenly you have Judaism, and then suddenly came Christianity. And then the day Christians are blaming the Jews for killing Jesus. They just forget that Jesus was born a Jew and died a Jew. He never heard the word Christianity in his life. But people are killing each other over this. Are you sure you want to go there right now with Jesus? Uh, no. I just mentioned him briefly. I don't want to discuss Jesus. Why don't we touch up with whatever you're, you're comfortable with sharing on that note? Because in the document, you actually don't speak about Jesus, partially because it's not in that timeline. Is there anything you'd like to share on that front? First of all, it's a different reincarnation. Number two, being of the Jewish faith, I feel more comfortable shitting on the people from the same faith as my own. I don't want to offend people. I might say things that you and your viewers will not like to hear. So I don't think we should talk about it. The only thing I'm willing to say, he was born a Jew, died, was a Jew. He was a highly evolved spiritual person who saw the injustices and corruption within the Jewish leadership at the time. 
and he brought it into light, and they don't like it. The same way, I'm not trying to compare you, but it's the same thing. They don't like you. Why people don't like you? Because you're bringing awareness and truth to the table. They want to keep you dumb. Same thing happened there. So the leadership somehow was under the control of the Roman Empire at the time. They made sure that the Romans would get a hold of him, and they got rid of him. You understand? You said it's a different reincarnation. Are you telling me that you have an experience or a memory with Jesus? Yes. Can you share a little bit? Because everything you just said sounds like a very positive thing in terms of who he is. So what would offend people exactly? All I'm telling you, he was, he's being called the son of God. We are all children of God. Jesus was a highly evolved spiritual being, but he was a human being. Just like I'm a human being, and you're a human being. We're all the same. He was smart. He was a leader. He was a strong leader. People started to follow him. The establishment did not like it because he screwed up with their business. He started hurting them with their control. And control translates into money. You understand? So they disliked him. The same way you're being censored all the time. Why are you being censored all the time? You're afraid that I might say something. And let's see, if I say something that the establishment is not happy about, you're going to delete it when you edit this video, which I'm okay with. I understand why you're doing it. Because they're doing it to take the video down, and you want the message to go out. Why can't I speak my mind? Why can't you speak your mind? I thought we live in a democracy. I thought we live in transparency. So who's going to decide what's true or not? Bill Gates? Elon Musk? Who's going to decide? Mr. Trump? Who's going to decide? Why do they have to decide what's true or not true? Your job is to get information out there, true or not true. Let the people decide on their own. And that's what happened then. If Jesus was living in the age of the internet, believe me, he would take over the world. He was able to do that because he spoke the truth. He went against the establishment. They didn't like him. They got rid of him. The same way today, they're going to get rid of a lot of people. How many doctors and people you know about that they just got rid of them? It's not only politicians. It's not only JFK. It's not only Bobby Kennedy they got rid of. We're also talking about Dr. Rashid just recently. He was murdered. He didn't die. Ask yourself why. They got rid of Trump from the presidency. You know, I thought they were probably going to put a bullet in his head. But today, they don't have to do that. There are other ways to get rid of a president. And they got rid of him. Okay? He wasn't smart enough or strong enough to stand up to the swamp. And they did what they did. I, I got to ask a question on something. I know we're, we're going to a bunch of different topics and we'll get back to the document at hand. But you mentioned Bill Gates and then you mentioned Elon Musk. Can I ask you your thoughts on Elon Musk? There's a lot of controversy on, you know, what people think he is in terms of like our side of the world. Like, is he good? Is he bad? It's very confusing because it's, it's a gray area. People don't know what to think. Well, you asked for transparency, so I'll give you transparency. I know he's your new buddy, but he just supported your movie that's about to come out. He's not my buddy. I've, I, I've never spoken to him, but yes, he supported the Sound of Freedom movie. Okay, which is a big help, which is a big support. It's going to make the movie a better success. Everybody's happy, right? But he's not different from Bill Gates. Would you take money from Bill Gates? No. So why did you take money from Elon Musk? We didn't take money from Elon Musk. Whatever. Support. Call it whatever you want. So let me ask you a question. Yes. Why do you think he supported such a movie if he's on their side? It's all about an agenda. Why is he supporting to putting a chip in your fucking brain? You think he's doing it for a greater good? Oh, paraplegic people will start walking. Blind people will start seeing. Yeah, if he will do it for that purpose, and I'm sure he will do it because it's part of the game. No problem. I support that. But he has an agenda. He wants to give it to every fucking kid alive. Ask yourself why. Why would you want to put a chip? And he's promoting it for years now. And he's about to do it soon. But he's saying, no, I'm doing it for paraplegics. I'm doing it for blind people. So everyone's saying, wow, what a righteous man. Take Bill Gates. He put, what, 40, 60 billion dollars in donations for the greater good? You believe he did that for the greater good? He's the only person in the world who took more than half of his value, donated it, 
and tripled his value in 10 years. So keep in mind, Elon Musk is one of them. He's not one of you. Okay? He did not put over $40 billion into Twitter knowing he's paying 100% more than the value. He's not stupid. But believe me, he's not losing money. He's just saying he's losing money. He will make deductions on his taxes as losing money. But no, he's getting the power he wants. He's getting the PR he wants. Because everybody sees him now. Oh, what a righteous man. Transparency all the way. What transparency? Take Bobby Kennedy. He's running to be president. They're not putting him on TV. The only place he goes is on the internet. People like you. You interviewed Bobby Kennedy. You're probably going to interview him again. I hope, anyway. But he's a man who's trying to come with his own truths. Why aren't they letting him talk? Because, he, because he's interfering with business. Not only Big Pharma, he's talking about the Pentagon, which is a business. It's not just an entity. NASA is a business. It's all about money and power. So he's a perfect example. They're not putting him on TV, and believe me, he's trying, he's fighting. So he's just summarized what we spoke about in the section right now. Because you asked me specifically about Elon Musk, I just want you to know that I'm very happy he did that because it's helping your cause, which I support that cause as well. Just don't be fooled that he's doing it for the right reason. He has his own agenda. Same thing with Bill Gates when he donated billions of dollars from pocket A to pocket B. He had an agenda. He had a PR image that he needed to fix. He had a PR problem. So he did what he did. He had his advisors that told him to start donating. So he's smart. He's donating to himself. And it's legal. While we're on the topic of, you know, elites and power and things like that, in the Pyramid Code, you speak a lot about technology used with the pyramids, for the pyramids, by the pyramids, electromagnetic pulsation, electromagnetic laser pulsation. I know there's a lot of that tying back to technology today and how, you know, some of those people are using that technology today. Can we segue into that topic and technology, the technology back in ancient Egypt, how you experienced it, what you remember, and then let's tie it back to why that's relevant to today and how it's being used, if it's being used. Let's talk specifically about the pyramids, and then if you want to move on to something else, we move to something else. But the pyramids were built basically on frequency. I'll give you an example. If I'm going to play a high frequency note here and put a glass here, the glass will break at a certain point because the frequency can break the glass from even 50 feet away. Frequency can elevate things. It doesn't make a difference how much it weighs. It can weigh a ton or a kilo. The right frequency at the right time, at the right note, can elevate a pyramid. Can elevate the stones to put them in place. So frequency is the base because everything in life is frequency. Everything. The camera is frequency. You have a frequency. Your heart has a frequency. Everything works on different frequencies. This is the way nature created us. So they had the ability to harness the frequency into a technology called EMP or EMLP, which is the L stands for laser. Everybody's asking, how could they build it? There were no cranes. They didn't need a crane. They lift it with frequency. But the technology is EMP. Unfortunately, those technologies disappeared from the world, from the public, which were very open at that time, and became a secret technology. Today, it's being held by the psychopaths. Before we go there, let's stick to the pyramids for one second, because I have questions there before we change the topic to current events. How did they use that? So you're saying they used electromagnetic pulsation and all that to build them. But how is that technology actually a part of the pyramids? There are a lot of big claims made in this document that pyramids can be used as crafts. They can move. They could shrink their base and fly far distances using this technology. Can you explain further on how this technology was applied and implemented to the pyramid itself? So let me finish my first thought first. Before I answer that, so technology of EMP, of EMLP today, unfortunately, is in the hands of the psychopaths. I personally believe that the United States government doesn't have it. I have a reason to believe that the Russian government and the Israeli government have some of this technology in their possession. But I can't guarantee it. 
but I can guarantee that the psychopaths have it, which are, let's name names. You want to name, so I'll give you names. Thank you all so much for tuning into the world premiere of The Pyramid Code Part 1. As you saw, Part 2 is now available for members only for a period of the next 30 days before the next world premiere, and it's available right now on Unified TV. So if you do want to watch Part 2 right now and help us support our mission and fund this mission moving forward, make sure to use the link in the description below, unified.tv, and make sure to take advantage of the annual plan at 50% off to sign up, become a member, and join the movement that is helping to awaken humanity. That is what we do, that is why we do it, and thanks to all of our members, we are able to make world premieres eventually free for everybody. But again, if you wanna watch The Pyramid Code Part Two right now, it's available on Unified TV with a link in the description below. If you're a member, you already have access. If you're not yet a member, make sure to sign up, and I look forward to hearing all of your feedback, and thank you all for your support. In the meantime, check out this trailer. There's eight billion people in this world, I promise you that 99% of them will not accept this information. They'll think it's a bunch of What do you think the codes will do once shared? How will that change things? It will change your entire outlook about life. And so if and when you have the code, again, it will be totally different information for you. You're going to see things in a totally different light. Therefore, you translate things like the common man. You have to learn it. You have to understand it. You have to know the code because the Bible has a code. Ask yourself, why are they hiding the fact there are UFOs? Why is it such a big secret? Everybody knows. Anybody with half a brain will know that they're hiding it for a reason. Everybody knows UFOs exist. You have to be a moron to think that you're a speck in the universe and that there's only life here. Why are they hiding it? because they are using free energy. This specific star, the Pyramid Star, it is a spiritual, known as the Spiritual Star. At the Pyramid Star, something is going on there, I don't know what, that brings you to the 10th dimension. There's nobody alive that I know today that can reach the 10th dimension. This is the holy of the holiest place on earth. The reason it's the holy of the holiest places is because this is the energy center of the universe. There are 36 energy centers in the world. This is the most powerful energetic power, and it's coming right from that rock. The fights that you see in Israel, it's not a religious fight. It's about this energy center. They want to get it because of its energy. And by the way, this energy can create free energy. This is all fake. The media is all fake. Politics is all fake. This is a brainwashing system that's been done for many, 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 many years. It didn't start today. It didn't start in the last 10 years. So you are in a position today where I started in 2010, where you're seeing the world in a different light from a different perspective. It's all about an agenda. You think he's doing it for a greater good?